Hello, and welcome to Introducing Me. I'm your host, Sarah. I started this podcast to get to know other people and lifestyles while discovering more about myself. Each episode, I will give a new guest a chance to discuss their background, culture, interests, or whatever they want to talk about to help increase all of our own worldviews. Today, I would like to introduce you to Jennifer Gassner. At 17 years old, Jennifer was diagnosed with a rare neuromuscular disease. It wasn't until after earning a bachelor's and master's that she realized she didn't need to be fixed, but her assumptions on being disabled was what needed to be fixed. So Jennifer's here to, you know, kind of share what, you know, her life has been like since that diagnosis, what she's going on and how, you know, she's sharing her story out broadly So thank you so much, Jennifer, for being here today. Why don't you go ahead and tell the audience more about yourself? Well, thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, My name is Jennifer Gassner, and I wrote a memoir called My Unexpected Life, Finding Balance Beyond My Diagnosis which goes through my uh, diagnostic journey and then finding out I have this rare progressive disease called Friedrich's ataxia. It's also a form of muscular dystrophy. And the book... The book details my journey uh, 10 years after that diagnosis, and I go from being really, really afraid to accepting myself, and I have some adventures along the way. Right. Well, so can you take us kind of back even like before, you know, it sounds like when the book starts to like what the process was even like getting a diagnosis, especially since it's a rare condition? Well, I in hindsight, I probably started having symptoms around like 12 or 13, but I didn't really begin to notice something was happening significantly until I was 16 when I started noticing my handwriting was getting worse. And I was constantly dropping things. In general, I had always been a klutz. I was always falling. I had accidents. I broke my glasses um, countless times. Uh, Many visits to the ER. Uh, So... Then my handwriting started declining, and then I just noticed walking in a straight line was becoming more difficult. Even the walking, walking the short distance from, like, my friend's front door to my mom's car in her driveway... I almost fell for no reason, really. And that's when my mom decided to take me to the doctor. And so then what was it like, you know, once you got that diagnosis and you had this fear, like what were you afraid of for happening with the future? Well, the... Initially, the fir- we saw a local neurologist, and he was basically a jerk, uh, and kind of blew me off, and was like, "Oh, that's nothing." 
you have nothing to worry about. But then, uh, my mom and I were still confused about what was going on. So we found a specialist uh, in a different town. I grew up in Wisconsin. And so we ended up going to Milwaukee to see a specialist. Uh, and it was almost a year after my that first visit with the neurologist. And he um he was able to give me the diagnosis at that point. And initially, he didn't talk to me directly when he diagnosed me because we lived we lived about an hour and a half north of Milwaukee. So he just called and spoke to my mom. And explain that I have Friedrich's ataxia. He said it was a mild case. And that uh, I should contact the Muscular Dystrophy Association for any they might be able to help with braces or going to the doctor or whatever it was. So and the day we got that phone call was but right before Labor Day weekend. And this is in nineteen ninety also. So it's um then it was Labor Day was always the Jerry Lewis MDA telethon, which was generally a twenty four hour long event and it talked to his kid, Jerry's kids, and they were mostly children, and they were wheelchair users, and I was like, I have nothing to do with this. My case is mild. I'm not going to be part of this. I'm not going to see myself in here, and then they talked to a boy who was in a wheelchair and he said, yeah, I have Friedrich's ataxia and my mouth fell. Like, oh my God. So I thought, my mind immediately went to my life is over. I'm going to be lonely. And have no life and just everything. I went down the rabbit hole. Well, that's why they tell you, you know, you shouldn't Google your medical issues because it's always, you know, going down the rabbit hole. <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's one of the things I'm so thankful. It was 1990. I couldn't Google it. <laughs> you know, um, so I didn't really have a a chance to really see the dire consequences or potential of the disease <laughs> day after day. So then what was it like? you know, progressing through college and, you know, kind of knowing that there's this potential coming for you when initially diagnosed, you know, 
what is even like a mild case and is your case can still considered mild i don't even know i mean i think there honestly there are so many variables in people who have who have um we'll just call it fa um People who have FA can be diagnosed, you know, as early as five and as late as 65. So, ge- in general terms, usually the earlier you're diagnosed, the worse it is. But it can affect your heart or it can't. Uh, you can have a lot more speech issues, which I obviously have some speech issues, but other people, uh, um, it's a lot more pronounced. So some people get into wheelchairs earlier, some don't. And now my dog woke up. <laughs> she wants to go out. <laughs> yes. The the joy as we were talking before we hit record about pets and whether or not they will do what you want to do. Yes. So then what was it like for you to first realize you needed a wheelchair? And what was that progress like for you? Well... I I walked in the I was ambulatory for till I was about twenty one and then I had a wheeled walker which at the time was you know a new Fing, fing dingle the instrument and now they're everywhere so but at the time in 1994 they were you know relatively new uh, and then I started using a wheelchair when I was 26 because I had fallen and it was, I hadn't, thankfully, I hadn't broken anything, but it was becoming obvious that it was just too dangerous for me to keep trying to walk with my walker. So, I kind of real, I was very reluctant about green to get a chair. But after I did, it was like so unbelievably freeing for me because with my walker, I only had energy to go so far but with a power wheelchair i had more freedom so far and when you first got the power wheelchair to say like now are you in a place where you're able to get around easily in accessible ways or do you find yourself up against difficult situations that aren't accessible to a wheelchair often? It depends on where I am. In general, I live in California now in San Diego in general, things in California are pretty easy and accessible. But if I go back to visit my family in Wisconsin, that's a different story. Because 
a lot of things just are not accessible or like a restaurant could totally be accessible but their bathroom may not be so you know so it's a little hit or miss here and there in doing those trips back to wisconsin are you getting on a plane or are you doing a long road trip I've done both. Which <laughs> which do you prefer? Like which goes better? I don't know. I mean, I uh, the plane is obviously quicker. <laughs> but my chair has more chance of getting broken um when i fly because they put me on a aisle chair to get me to my seat and then transfer me over so and then take my wheelchair down to where the bags are and it sometimes it gets damaged in that transport. Yes. So then what, you know, you mentioned one of your fears early on was being alone. And now, you know, you're not at home in Wisconsin with your family. So what, you know, kind of how did how did that all happen? If, if you want to talk about that. Yeah, so basically the job I had at that time in Wisconsin uh, in 2001, the job was grant funded and the grant was ending. So I was going to have to find a new job no matter what. And it had been the first winter I had spent in Wisconsin as a wheelchair user. And it was horrible. I hated it. Partly because the snow makes it so much more difficult. You get stuck. All this stuff, but then I also had a service dog. So I have to take her out two or three times a day. The energy it takes to get dressed in the winter to (laughs) just take the dog out was a lot. And I was like, I... I can't keep doing this. And I had a friend who lived out here, and she graciously told me I could stay with her and her husband until I found my own place. Right. And now, you know, you don't have to worry about snow. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And so you've... You know, you've written a memoir about this and and various aspects of your life. So what was it like, you know, getting everything written, getting the story published? Like, what was that? What even sparked you to say, I want to get my story into a book? Well, I've always wanted to write a book. And it wasn't until, and I've written things here and there along the way. And then um, 10 years ago, I had to stop working for health reasons. And I was like, I'm going to take a writing class. And so I just kind of got 
the bug and was encouraged by my teachers there to keep going. And I kind of took a couple of years off from doing it. But then in 2018, I was all in. And almost every day I wrote something. So, and, and I, uh, I knew I, I was torn a little between do I try to get an agent and do traditional publishing? Or should I go the route which I ended up doing, which was hybrid publishing, where it's kind of a cross between self-publishing and traditional. You still, they still do the editing and they get everything formatted and ready for um ebook and to be ordered on Amazon and things like that. Um and you have the final say on what gets published. So and you have some more rights to to your work than you do with a traditional publisher. So, um, and then there was something else I was going to say about that. Uh, no, I can't remember. That's okay. (laughs) So you got the book published. What was that moment like? Okay, so I got COVID. <laughs> in yeah, in uh, twenty one May of twenty twenty one, and I called a friend and was like. I I need to get this out of here because I was just worried mm-hmm. something was going to happen to me. So I felt a sense of urgency, like I had to get this done. And I knew this local hybrid, and so I contacted them, and they... Thankfully, took my story and have believed in me. And they had it published within about 13 months from that day. So. And so what was that feeling then, like 13 months later, post-COVID, saying, my book is out there? It was very weird. My books arrived and I went ballistic. I was just, I couldn't believe it. Mm-hmm. Because partly, partly too, because my picture is on the front of it. So. It just was very, very surreal. Definitely. Now you mentioned with this book how you, know, you had some some stories along the way um, in your journey that you've you've shared um, in the book. So do you want to share, you know, kind of some of those stories now about, you know, maybe maybe some high points in this journey since you were first diagnosed at seventeen. <laughs> Yeah, that so the the biggest high point well yeah it's the biggest high point 
without a doubt, is uh, when I met Dave Matthews, uh, and, well, meeting him was, like, the first time I met him, and I thought that was going to be the only time, really. But then I saw him again six months later, and he remembered me. I didn't have to be like, hey, I'm Jen, you know. How's it going? We met a few months ago, and he was like, no, I met you at the show in uh, Iowa, right? Okay, yeah. (laughs) Great. And we became buddies, and I went to many of his shows. And developed a friendship with him. And I had asked, I didn't ask him intentionally. I asked him for ideas for a fundraiser for a van that had a drop floor. For when I use a wheel used a wheelchair, cause I was still walking at the time, and so I had just asked him for ideas, cause another friend of mine had wanted to do this fundraiser, but it fell through, and so I just. Wanted to ask for ideas, not the actual van, because I didn't want to be that girl, you know. And he, all he said to me was, we'll figure it out. And I was like, uh, okay, I don't really know what that means, but okay. So it took about a year to finally get it figured out and then we uh we had to find a nonprofit for him to donate money to and they would buy the van for me. So, which, I mean, when I tell you right now, the price of the van was $40,000, which back then, in 1995, 96, was a lot of money. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And, um, in fact... Nowadays, a van like that costs like a hundred grand. So, just to kind of give you an idea, it's an expensive vehicle. It's not not an easy thing to get. Mm-hmm. And is the van still around? Unfortunately, no. You got in a car accident. What are you willing to talk about what that experience was like? Oh, yeah, I blew a tire on the freeway and it made me spin around. (laughs) Oh, gosh. Well, yeah, you know, the fact that. Dave Matthews was able to end up getting you, you know, your first van uh, to be able to move around with a wheelchair. Um, That very first meeting with him, like, was it kind of happen chance? Was it something sort of planned? Because then, you know, you kept going to concerts. 
Well, my my friend Kevin, uh, at that at the time, he owned his own agency in Minneapolis, and he was serving a lot of colleges in the Midwest, and one of the things he started to do was uh, be middle agent. So, like, this, this was at Luther College, which is a tiny college in the middle of nowhere in Iowa. <laughs> and they wanted Dave Matthews. Well, the agency that represented Dave Matthews Monterey Peninsula artists, they aren't going to talk to anyone from Luther College. <laughs> so they hired Kevin to negotiate the deal for them. And so Kevin brought, told me to come to the show and then brought me backstage. It's a good thing to know, Kevin. Uh. Yes, it was. <laughs> believe me. <laughs> and so were you like a big Dave Matthews fan before this? I wouldn't. I... <clears throat> I was. I had seen him before one other time. But when I got there, I was shocked by um, the amount of people that seemed to be a lot more familiar with him and some of the songs he had played, like I had never heard of quite a few of them, and everyone else seemed to know them, and I really had no idea. And then I found, oh, yeah, he's been around for a while, actually. And now I, I don't know, um, you know, when Dave Matthews' last tour was. Um, or kind of like what he's up to now. So what has, you know, since these meetings with Dave Matthews been like, you know, have you still been able to go to things when he has been touring? I, I still get tickets. I haven't been able to like go see him. Uh, like go backstage and see him, but um, I get little envelopes with the stickers on them that say, like, for Jen Gassner, uh, requested by Dave Matthews. Those little, you know, those little things that are kind of cool. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's definitely, you know... The fact that, you know, one one meeting from Kevin, good friend Kevin, to bring you backstage yeah. to then, you know, everything yeah. since, um, I think just kind of like shows the power of, you know, kind of like what one person can do, one story, you know, that, that you might be inspired by. Now, are you, um, is it just Dave Matthews concerts you go to or are you a frequent concert goer? When I was in college, I was a frequent concert goer by far, but I haven't been to many, if any, since since COVID. I, oh, wait. I did go see Dave Matthews <laughs> after COVID in Wisconsin. But, um... 
Have I, what? Yeah, I haven't really gone to anything since COVID. I'm a big Pearl Jam fan in Depeche Mode and I got all kinds of weird stuff. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. Everyone likes what they like. Um, yeah. And honestly, you know, kind of like the since COVID concert scene, you know, everyone's kind of doing different things and choosing whether or not, like, is this something I want to venture out and do? And yeah, you know, you mentioned that experience with COVID. Was that your only time getting it or have you been unfortunate? <laughs> so far, yeah. And was that something that it ended up like just kind of passing through or was it more difficult for you since you have a disability? Well, I was able to get a uh, Paxlovid. Mm -hmm. That is, that was it, what is called the antiviral. I was able to get that. I felt much better after I had that. For about three or four days. And then I kind of had a rebound infection where it wasn't really the coughing symptoms or anything. I was just really tired and really fatigued. And it actually took me about three weeks to test negative yeah. for it. Wow. So. But you got, you got through it. You got to get to see your, yeah. your book published, um, yes. which is, which is good. Now, what is your, you know, projection for the future are things, you know, is your diagnosis going to continue to progress? Or have you kind of like stagnated? Do you do you have any idea what the future? I mean, like nobody knows what the future holds, but. I think I've plateaued in terms of my progression. I'm supposed to be starting this new medication. The FDA approved a medication just last year. Uh, the very first treatment for Friedrich's ataxia, and I'm ho I'm hopefully gonna be starting that soon. Um, it's supposed to at least help with my speech and my uh hand, my motor skills. So I'm hoping for that, but we'll see. Yes, the, the medical system isn't necessarily known for its speed, um, but hopefully, yeah. hopefully you can get that going and, you know, that can kind of help with, uh, the, you know, those things you were just saying. Um, and one other thing, you know, that... I kind of had mentioned early on, and I think you've maybe touched that a little bit is, you know, this change from fear to more of an acceptance. What has acceptance been like for you, you know, being aware of changes that were upcoming and as as changes have progressed? Well, I think for a long time. I had a very black and white view of disability or what normal is or, you know, whatever. And now I realize there are lots of gray areas. It's, it's nuanced in so many ways. And there are so many variations. None of them are wrong. It's just the way they are. And they're, and they're okay the way they are. 
There was no need to make them into some version of everyone else. Yeah, I think that's, you know, a good a good viewpoint to to have gotten to. Um, I think disability and, you know, various progressions of life is something that more and more is becoming visible um, that people are starting to be more aware of, but wasn't necessarily something that was in the forefront, even, you know, in the 90s when you were first going yeah. going through things. Yeah, it was a, it's a very different experience now than back then. So, but I, I have to say, like, I look back at your past episodes and stuff, and I was really impressed about how many episodes you have that were like about neurodivergence or people with learning disabilities or um invisible disabilities or whatever it was i thought that was very interesting because not a lot of people want to have those conversations Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely something that, you know, people are realizing that if they share their story, you know, people, other people might feel less alone. So I think part of that adds to like why we're seeing more and more of it. Um, Yeah. And on that note, you know, you saw this boy in a wheelchair, you know, when you were young and didn't know what your future held. Have you met somebody with your same condition? I have, and we're all different. We're all completely different. But uh, but again, like if I've said this, I wouldn't have written my book. Also, if I didn't think it would make somebody feel less alone Mm. and that's really what i wanted because if i would have had something like that to read when i was going through it then i wouldn't have felt so alone and i did feel alone Uh, i think that's such like a great you know wanting to put yourself out there for other people um is is a great way to do it a great reason why um you know to to say that and you know be thinking of others thinking you know the experience you went through and you know what might others others be thinking now before i start to wrap things up and ask my random question is there anything else you would like to share with the listeners today No, I just, one of the things I hope that people learn, and at least for my book, maybe not necessarily from this discussion, is that people with disabilities aren't tragedies. Uh, we bring value to the world and being different isn't good or bad. It's just different. That is definitely important for people to hear. Um, and I think hearing your story today, you know, I don't think people would be thinking like, oh, Jen's life, tragedy. She's a tragedy. You know, you've had some exciting things happen in your life. Um, you know, you're you're wanting to share and you've got good people around you doing great things. Um, so that's definitely a, a good reminder for people. Now, as I mentioned, you know, I do ask all my guests a random question. You know, we know that you have a dog, but if you had a pet parrot, what would you want to teach your parrot to say? 
Wow. Hmm. Gosh. I'm tempted to say a swear word. A swear word. <laughs> well, my my good good girlfriends and I always we call each other bitches. So it might be some like, "Hey, bitch," <laughs> or some I don't know something stupid like that. All right, that brings this episode to a close. So, of course, if you would like to connect with Jen, her Facebook and Instagram social media links will be in the description. And if you're interested in checking out her book, My Unexpected Life, Finding Balance Beyond My Diagnosis, you can get that anywhere where you normally buy books, um, including Barnes & Noble. And of course, it is also on Amazon. So that link will be in the description as well. And if you would like to connect with the podcast, our website is in the description. It brings you to our social media. We are on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And it also brings you to all of our past episodes, resources, social media, all of that good stuff is there. So feel free to go check that out. And if you would like to support the podcast monetarily, there is a link to do that as well. And of course, if you would like to be a guest on the show and share your story, my email is in the description. That is always the best way to reach me and get in touch. So thank you so much, Jen, for spending time with me today and to my listeners for taking the time out of your day to hear a new story. Until next time. Bye. Bye.